I'm Christian Dorsey and you're watching Voice Box. One of the unique things about the world that we live in today is that we're overloaded with information. But how much of it is really focused on what is nearest and dearest to us, our local communities? To be able to give you the news that you can use and understand the true role that many people and organizations are having in making our community one that we're proud of. And while most people have really strong opinions about transportation, our panel tonight augments those strong opinions, the wealth of experience and expertise where we can get into the very sticky and thorny issues that deal with transportation in our very diverse and a uh, vast metropolitan area. Joining us tonight from the Washington Post, the titular Dr. Gridlock, Robert Thompson. Welcome, Bob. Thanks very much. All right. And we also have from the uh, Fenty Administration's Department of uh, Transportation, the DC Department of Transportation, Gabe Klein, the former head of that agency, who prior running DDOT, was also a regional executive with the Zipcar car sharing program. And we also have Chris Hamilton, who is the Bureau Chief for Arlington County Commuter Services, an organization that you'll hear, an agency that you'll hear more about, is responsible really for the county's efforts to reduce vehicular travel and create a more sustainable transportation network in our community. So, gentlemen, let's just get right to it. And uh, I want to start with you, Bob, to talk about roads. Because when most people think of traffic, commuting, roads are really at the center of the agenda. And we have some chronic issues with roads in our area. And, you know, there was the, the story I read about maybe yesterday about Constitution Avenue uh, being essentially reconstructed uh, right at the foot of the uh, Teddy Roosevelt Bridge, something that's going to affect a great many commuters in Arlington. And it was the first time I had heard about it. And, uh, you know, I'm curious as to, uh, you know, what your perspectives are as to far, as, as how our region deals with road repair and improvement. Do you think we're doing a good job, first of all, in, uh, in, in not only keeping residents informed, but in really tackling the, the key chronic issues that need to be addressed? Well, you know, I, uh, I am the dear Abbey of traffic. Most of my <laughs> readers drive. Most of them, unfortunately, drive alone. And uh, they, they share their troubles with me. And a project like the Constitution Avenue project is very troubling to them. There's never there's never a good project as, as far as my travelers are concerned. So uh, I wouldn't set, set that as a, as a benchmark. What I look for as a project develops is simply how many letters I get. Mm. The, the reconstruction of the Springfield interchange, I knew that was going pretty well because I didn't get very many letters about that, at least not till the thing froze over back in 2008. Uh, I tend to get a lot of letters about National Park Service projects, unfortunately, mm. and Constitution Avenue is one of them. The, uh, the National Park Service, you always have to keep in mind what their middle name is. They're into parks, not so much roads. <laughs> and uh, they, they, don't, they don't like to widen roads, uh, as opposed to what my readers wish would happen. They, they like to uh, preserve trees. Concrete and asphalt is kind of low on their agenda, but unfortunately they control a lot of the roads that my uh, travelers drive on. And it, I can predict right now Constitution Avenue is going to be a big hassle, uh, just <laughs> as Lincoln Circle was, uh, just as uh, just about uh, the Humpback Bridge project mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. going on now. Uh, they don't do such a good job either communicating what they're doing in road projects. Yeah. And and I think, I think in? that's the key. I think the reason that Springfield Interchange wasn't a problem was because VDOT had a really mm -hmm. aggressive and well thought out communications program. And so with everything that's going on in the region from, you know, the Beltway projects and to all the little projects downtown and in Arlington, the mm -hmm. key is to communicate with the consumers. And so uh, DDOT and Arlington actually got together yesterday and started talking about the Constitution Avenue project and what do we need to do to get out through our communications departments mm -hmm. to talk to citizens, to talk to communities 
commuters to try to switch them to different routes or to get them to take different alternatives. But communications is the key, and I think Bob hit on it. And, and that's an interesting street, actually, uh, 15th Street. It's really a boulevard because Park Service controls, I believe, 15th to 23rd, and the city controls 3rd to 15th. So because of the nature of this project and where it is, it falls into the Park Service. We've known for uh, a good year, year and a half that it was coming, but not exactly when. And we've had the same experience with the, with the Park Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, VDOT did a tremendous job in a lot of these mega projects, which is why we stole the chief engineer for mega projects for, <laughs> for DC. One of the reasons. Stole, borrowed, regional cooperation, yeah. it's all good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. But you know, uh, since we have these, these chronic issues with roads and we really can't in any community expect to, to widen roads, there's usually a lot of opposition to that. And, Usually it's cost prohibitive to find the, uh, the resources to create new roads where none exist. Uh, obviously, a, a great regional effort has been made to reduce vehicular traffic. And, and Gabe, you kind of uh, you know, came at this from a different kind of way, uh, looking at D.C. and implementing some, some programs to actually reduce the demand for parking as a way of reducing vehicular traffic. Some of it was a little controversial. People didn't uh, sure. really love it. Tell us a little bit about kind of why you, you pursued that approach and what are some of the things that you thought it would, yeah. would do. Well, first of all, if you're being proactive in your approach and there's no controversy, you're probably not working hard enough. So I'm fine with that. Um, and the other thing is if you build capacity, that capacity will be filled. And we've learned that over the last 50 years. Uh, if we expanded uh, 66, uh, whatever we do, um, it'll fill with cars. And um, it's not because cars are bad, it's just the nature of supply and, and, and demand. And uh, we as a, as a people and as a government have decided that um, we don't want the congestion, we don't want the smog, and we want livability. We want to create a, um, a society where people can sort of live, work, and play in these urban dense areas, or at least a lot of us have in urban places. So because we can't do things like congestion pricing, uh, which they've done over in London and, and other European cities and recently failed in New York, when you look at the district, it's very unique. Um, we don't have the powers of a state, even though we're treated as a state by the federal government. And so um, there are limited ways that we can control how many people come in and out of the city. Uh, a lot of that is with policy, but also with pricing. And we can't toll, because that would never fly with our friends on the Hill, right? Particularly in Maryland and Virginia. Um, I think that'll change uh, down the road when we look at how we're going to you know, save uh, the South Capitol Bridge, which is a half billion dollar project. So we definitely made some advancements in terms of parking. Um, we had uh, what Donald Shoup, who's sort of the godfather of parking policy, said was the, um, the most advanced parking policy in the United States, if not the world, because we were trying new things. And yes, we did raise rates, and the r rates were raised by the council actually before we got to put a lot of the new technology in. But then we started testing all the latest and greatest technologies because there are so many. And uh, there's the old line meters, but a lot of the, the, the new companies are offering new solutions and they're technology companies. Right. They're virtual. And so we tried a lot of things. We figured out what worked best by talking to the public, getting their feedback, as well as our own employees in terms of what was working and, and what wasn't working. And uh, right when I was leaving, we were ready to employ a lot of uh, policies and new programs citywide. You know, the, the, the vitriol associated with Metro is something that uh, seems to rise each and every year, and it's at an, an incredible level right now. So I'm, I'm curious as to how that impacts your work, trying to actually get people to utilize a system that there's a growing amount of absolute vitriol associated you with. You always love, have a love-hate relationship, you know, with something that you depend on like that. And yeah. so... Um, yeah, the more people depend on Metro, the more they're going to have that love-hate relationship and the more there's going to be growing pains. And the system has just been, you know, whether it's the bus or the rail system, more people are taking Metro than ever before. And so as they do, we're going to run into problems and the customers are going to vent their frustrations. But I think they vent with a little bit of love. And they're saying, please help us. We love our metro system. It's what brings this region together. Um, people love their commute. They love their stations. They love their station ma you know, manager. Um, they get to know the, the neighborhoods ar around where they're getting off in the morning and the afternoon. And so they just want it to work better. And so when they complain, I think we in the government 
uh, embrace those complaints and we try to work harder to uh, address those concerns. But, you know, I don't think it's a bad thing when the customers are telling us what they want. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, as you can see, this is going to be a great conversation here tonight, and we're only getting started. You can join in on the VoiceBox conversation by sending us an email to voicebox at arlingtonmedia.org, and in just a second, we'll flash up on the screen the number that you could use to call in so that you can have your questions answered on VoiceBox. That number is 703-524-2348, and in just a few minutes, we're going to also have questions from our studio audience who have joined this conversation tonight. Uh, you know, moving on from, from Metro, I, was, uh, I came across a blog today, I think it was Unsuck Metro. Mm -hmm. was, was it, I guess you're familiar with it, yes, Chris? Sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thought it was pretty creative. Uh, but <clears throat> Metro was really uh, at the center of really what was a colossal systemic failure that the region experienced mm -hmm. at the end of January with, uh, you know, with the snow ice storm where it was absolutely no good way to get from one point to another and you know I, I'm certainly not alone but I had a seven hour commute to go seven miles that included metro rail metro bus and my good old two feet Bob why is it this region you know the the, the nation's capital some would say the capital of the free world why can't we figure out with a few inches of snow and ice on the ground how to move people from point A to point B because we couldn't afford it at least not in the winter. I, I'd, I'd actually cut Metro some slack on, on the performance in January, just as I would also cut the, uh, the road department some slack on, on that particular thing. I remember that was January 26th. I know that's what you're talking about. Yeah. That was mm -hmm. the night the storm hit exactly at 4 that's p.m. Right, it right. was exactly as predicted, and it's exactly the kind of storm that transportation departments around here cannot handle because they send out their equipment and it gets stuck on the same roads that everybody else is trying to use. Now with, with Metro, they just uh, don't, well, you know very well they have a lot of problems with their equipment and they don't do what New York or Boston or Chicago does in terms of hardening the system. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they tend to retreat pretty fast. Uh, as we saw not this past winter but the winter before when uh, things get pretty heavy outdoors. It's just not something that a, a mid-Atlantic region like this is ever going to be prepared for and in a way, an odd way, it's a good thing because it would cost a fortune and it would almost never uh, be money well allocated because we just don't have that many chances to, to get deep into the snow. Thankfully for everybody. Mm -hmm. well, but in fact, we two did. years in a row, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gabe was out. <laughs> we had like the year before 70 this. inches the uh, year before. But uh, that, yeah, that was just unbelievable. That was an experience, though, that you uh, wouldn't take back because it was just so amazing to live right. through it. Uh, but Gabe, you wouldn't plan for that either, would you? You wouldn't no. set up your well, snow budget okay. that way. I, I would say you would plan for it, you wouldn't budget to it. Uh. Um, because you have to have these emergency uh, uh, plans in place. And um, what surprised me a little bit about January 26th, I was actually on TV the, the next day saying, you know, uh, there's nothing these guys could have done, really. Right. I mean, it did hit at 4 o'clock. It became sort of a comedy of errors, and all the plows got stuck. But it is a little um, unnerving that that could happen with a couple inches of slush, and then you start to think, what if there really was... Right. something serious that happened, like another 9-11 type right. thing. And, and that's where I think you really need a lot of regional uh, coordination. Um, and I, I don't know if we're quite up to snuff there. Yeah, I think that's where we got caught flat-footed. I think, you know, if there was a lack of anything that day, um, it was that the region somehow just missed it. The federal government mm -hmm. let people all out at once, and then the local governments are reacting with the snow plows, metros right. caught off guard. So, you know, better regional planning would be yeah. the key to planning for that. And I want to get into that a little bit later in terms of the regional planning and what it would take because for a lot of people, you know, lay, lay people, you know, they're thinking exactly what you just said. This was predicted. It, it came exactly as advertised. Why, what would it have been like if this were just something that happened? 
you know, what would have been the like situation the then? Tornado. Or right. 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 Well, and you also have to put maybe a little bit of the onus on the people themselves. I mean, everybody rushed mm -hmm. out at the same time. Did they need to do that? Some people could have stayed back and sit, sat in their office till seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I left at about eight and the roads were clear by then. So um, you have to take some personal responsibility. And maybe if, if it, people realized it was going to snow, they could have teleworked that day or they could have taken an alternative. So, but again, I think that day that the weather was just so weird that, that yeah. it was a kind of snow that people didn't really, you know, plan for. And so, I, I, I think, think you're blaming the victim here. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the people. You are the voice of the people, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, I, I thought it was up to our transportation agencies to be much more honest with us. I think they knew that this was exactly the kind of storm that they are least prepared to handle. And they, they tend to have a, a gung-ho mm. spirit. They'll, they'll send out press releases to people like me saying, we're ready. We've, we've got our, they, and indeed they are right. ready. They do a much better job at getting ready now than they ever did before. But you can't fight Mother Nature on, right. on some mm -hmm. of these right. things, and they've got to be honest with us about that. Well, Bob, if, if I was at DDOT, we would have been totally honest with you, but I, <laughs> I, 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 had, I had already left. But it was also, it, it was an opportunity to remind people of, you know, the great work that Chris does, for instance, um, around uh, transit-oriented development and, 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 and demand management, that if it's so painful to get back to Virginia or to Upper Maryland, live in the district or live in Arlington, you know, live, work, and play in the same area because, oh well, it's true, though, because people say, oh, it's so expensive to live in Arlington or to live in the district. But when you take out the cost of your automobile, you know, which people spend a lot on, fuel, I just put money in my smart car, I mean, put gas in my smart car, it's $4 a gallon. It's even expensive to, to fill up a smart car, never mind like a V8. So you start to educate people on the, the true costs uh, in terms of actual dollars and cents and quality of life. Maybe we can get more people to move closer in. We have the, the space. We have the capacity. We had 200,000 more residents in the district in the 50s than we do now. Yeah. And the true cost of, you know, is tw about $12,000 a year to own a vehicle, mm -hmm. own and operate a vehicle. But I think, you know, you bring up a good point. More people are mo moving into the urban core than ever before. More people are working in Arlington and the district, more people are living in Arlington and the district. And that's because these are great places to live, work, and play, and they're all walkable, or you can transit, or you Cycling. can bike. We've got a capital bike share yes. bike here. Yeah. You know, we want to promote that. And so, you know, if more people would think about the costs of the choices mm -hmm. they make in, in housing mm -hmm. and where they live and take into account that it it costs twelve thousand dollars a year to operate. Well, I'm gonna push back on this a little bit because you know we, we've got we've got a lot of transportation options in the region, mm -hmm. but but in many ways let's not you know put too much spin on it. The mm -hmm. car is still king, and it's a necessity for a lot of people, uh, people with children, uh, certain people who have uh, you know certain entrepreneurial businesses where a vehicle is required. You know the the, the efforts to uh, you know persuade people to live closer in so that they can perhaps forego a car. Uh, don't really speak to everyone. It's not really a, a sensible choice for a lot of people. So I'm just curious as to how you, you think about that because I, I know from your columns a lot of people perceive that, that our region kind of has a, an anti-car bias uh, against, two against thirds folks. Two-thirds of trips are less than two miles. So, you know, right. and you don't, everybody doesn't have to take the bus or walk or bike all the time. But if they just think about their choices and sometimes take those alternatives. Um, we'll reduce gridlock and we'll reduce the load on the environment. So I think that's all we're asking. I think we do know that, you know, there's a segment of the population that's always going to drive their car and there's some people that need it sometime. And so uh, we have to accommodate that, but increasingly and in the future, if we're going to remain prosperous as a region, we have to start to accommodate people who bike, walk, and take transit over the car. Right, and, and this is about land use too, you know, it's, I mean, you have to look at it Transportation, people think about, you know, roads and cars and buses. You have to take a much more holistic approach, I think, as a, as a government official, you know, when you're looking at it. And we worked very closely with the planning department, with uh, Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, because it's about creating opportunities for people to live in the city. And if you educate them, you know, back to my, my other point, that it's costing them $1,000 a month to have a car, that buys a lot of mortgage, a lot of real estate. 
And the other thing is, a lot of people that are less affluent are spending a much higher percentage mm -hmm. of their income. For, in for instance, e east of the river in D.C., uh, we found out people were spending up to 53% of their income on transportation. And that's just not fair. Um, so we need to build in more density. We need to give people more opportunities with different layers of transportation. And we also need to make it fun. Like, it's now really fun to live in Arlington, which when I moved here 15 years ago, this, this was a bunch of empty lots, mm -hmm. you know, and you did have to have a car. Uh, the people, the um, millennials, is it, that are coming up sure, now? Sure, sure. Yeah. These folks, um, they aren't getting driver's licenses. Licenses. They aren't, uh, th they're putting off buying a car. Uh, and they're communicating via, you know, iPad. And so things are changing, and we have to either uh, facilitate that change and be part of it or sort of get run over by it. And in, in the district, 11%, we've seen an 11% reduction in, in registrations over the last three years. And we've seen 82% spike in cycling. Mm -hmm. Some of that's government policy. Some of that is people just doing what they're going to do. Right. We're going to get into some more questions in a second, but I want to give my studio audience a chance. If anyone has a question right now, otherwise I'll get more into it, talking about individual behavior. So, anyone? Yes. Fine-looking gentleman in the striped tie. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Smith. I am a union official. I represent commercial drivers, specifically the drivers who drive the ART buses mm -hmm. here in Arlington, the P Potomac Ramp uh, Rappahannock Transportation Commission buses, the Omni Ride, Omni Link buses, and the Fairfax Connector buses, big bus systems that uh, serve a lot of, uh, a lot of commuters. Um, and I want to talk about uh, and get your feedback on the uh, lack of supply of drivers. That's been something I think, I don't, I don't know if it was in the post, but there has been a little bit of attention given to that recently. There are a lot of vacancies at the metro system. Mm -hmm. there, are a little, there are vacancies throughout these bus operations. And I'd like to see, obviously, those vacancies filled. I'd like to see more people prepared to, to fill them. It's a, not an easy job to do. It's demanding, uh, not just because you have to uh, have physical requirements, you have to be subject to random um, testing. Mm -hmm. Uh, blood and alcohol, but it's demanding because you transport people in really a tough environment. Narrow roads, um, actually bad roads, poorly constructed roads, roads that weren't designed for, mm -hmm. you know, buses that are 40 feet or longer. I uh, used to have articulate buses mm -hmm. in the district. I still think they have a few of those that are even sure. longer. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have a lot of problems, and I know that the operators, the bus drivers, get a, a bad rap for accidents, for sometimes the perception that they're not uh, very, very uh, friendly or customer friendly. But I think that we don't give them enough credit um, and we don't put enough emphasis on preparing people to fulfill these important jobs. Mm -hmm. Nor do we train them at all to undertake emergency management. Mm -hmm. These right. kinds of episodes that we see with the weather, heaven forbid a 9-11, you know, the operators of these buses, they do their best. They get, uh, you know, periodic training, but there really isn't an emphasis on preparing them to be first responders. Mm -hmm. Charles, let's stop there because I saw some nods when it came to the point about there not being enough uh, drivers and a lot of vacancies going on. What's, what's the deal with that? It was always my perception that bus drivers are fairly well compensated uh, position for not an advanced education requirement. Uh, but there's a, a shortage? In, in Metro's recent budget cuts, and it has made budget cuts uh, of a sort over the past couple of years, one of the things I think they now realize was not such a good budget cut was to uh, scale back on, on personnel, driving personnel. And uh, one of the things that resulted in was simply a bigger overtime budget. and you. Right. I have tremendous admiration for our bus drivers. When I board a bus, I try to sit up near the operator just to watch what he or she does. Uh, and uh, I'm also paid to drive in traffic, and I, th I think what they do is, is just tremendous. I couldn't maneuver a vehicle that big through, through so many lanes of traffic, watching for pedestrians and bikers as well as cars. Uh, dealing with passengers at the same time. That's a rough job. I also think improving our, our bus system is the key to doing anything about congestion in our lifetime. That we, we need those dedicated 
bus lanes. We need to make it easier to drive a bus. We need to make it easier to ride a bus. This is, this is a key element in improving our system. Yeah. And Gabe, I know in DC, you try to, to, to really increase the amount of uh, you know, not traditional big metro buses, but the circulator right. size buses to get right. some service into uh, some harder to reach areas yeah. and to increase some frequency, give people some access. Right. What were some well, of the success of all, stories there? I agree with everything that, that uh, Bob said. Um, bus service is key, and that's one of the initiatives I had for this year had I stayed, um, was to really look hard at, at bus rapid transit um, to work uh, with Arlington and with Southern Maryland on really creating that uh, bus rapid transit through 66 over the 14th Street Bridge, down K Street and up Route 1. I think it is important. I have mixed feelings about it within the city, um, but it certainly can work and cities like New York are showing that. With the circulator bus system, um, we went from 40 foot down to 30 foot buses uh, on some routes, which were tighter than new Adams Morgan route, for instance, mm -hmm. which runs all the way down to McPherson. I think bus service is going to change a lot over the next 10, 20 years. I think the types of vehicles used, I think, um, diverted fixed route service where it has a little more flexibility is something that's probably going to happen in the next decade. Um, but uh, to, to this gentleman's point, um, these are hard jobs. You know, there's macro problems and there's micro problems. I mean, training for emergency management is a macro problem you see across different bus systems. Metro's got their own particular issues uh, that, that Bob uh, mentioned. Um, scaling back on drivers, big mistake. Over time is a big part of their problem. Our circulated drivers make about 30, 40 percent less than mm -hmm. metro drivers, mm -hmm. but when you really drill into it, it's predominantly overtime that is the difference, right? They also have an issue where you have to be a trained, fully trained uh, bus driver before you can become a metro rail driver. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as somebody gets really good, they're considered to move to rail, and then mm -hmm. you've got a vacancy. And so it's this vicious cycle of massive amounts of overtime, constant training, and I don't know that they have the training program in place that, for instance, First Transit has on the circulator system that is, I've actually witnessed it, it's top notch. Um, and, and I have some other thoughts on bus service, but I'll Yeah, and I want to go to Chris in a second, but Gabe, I want to, yeah. so, so, so essentially, uh, Metro has created a system where you, you're encouraged yeah. to actually leave Metro bus operations if you seek, I guess, uh, more pay, uh, more career prestige by moving onto the rail. I presume that that comes with a higher rate of pay, so. Yes, yeah, so, and I think uh, they uh -huh. sort of, ask you to. So yeah. they're always short on drivers for Metro bus. And um, I don't think that's going to change in, until there are some systemic changes in the system. And, and you know, I would go so far as to say that Metro, with all the problems that they have, needs to look hard at whether they should be uh, operating buses. Um, I think they do wonderfully at overseeing bus service. They oversee the circulator bus, but it's managed by First Transit. And we were just talking in, in the green room about this. Um, we tried to build the circulator service uh, because we couldn't afford to keep paying Metro. You know, we were uh, spending 40% less to operate the circulator, which is a Belgian-made bus, 10-minute mm -hmm. headways, you know, more reliable. And so just fiscally, you have to look at, uh, all the local jurisdictions have to look at taking the bus service in-house and mm. privatizing it. And then the question is, well, can Metro really fix their rail system and be proactive and operate it and excite people again? and operate bus service. And I think it's a question that needs to be asked. Chris, I want to ask you, uh, moving the, the bus conversation more locally to Arlington, uh, I live near Columbia Pike uh, in South Arlington, and there's you know great talk about perhaps imp implementing a light rail system on Columbia Pike. Streetcar. Uh, streetcar. Uh, uh, a thoroughfare that is currently uh, served by an array uh, of the, the, the 16 bus line. Mm -hmm. And you know they, they pretty much come every five minutes during mm -hmm the rush hour period and you know a lot of people have a question given the uh, high availability of, of affordable bus service on Columbia Pike what's the necessity to bringing a streetcar there what what transportation need does the streetcar serve that the bus system currently doesn't and, and the thought there is that this is a you know a public policy way of of sort of stigmatizing bus system as opposed to some other forms of transportation the simple answer is that um, we could move more people on the streetcar and it's going to attract more people to the system. I mean, the, the research shows us that people are more willing to get on a streetcar than they are on a bus. 
I think we need to do a better job on educating people about the bus. And I think Gabe's right that um, bus service in the future can be a lot better with low floor buses and new modern European style smaller buses in the neighborhoods. Um, but I think Bob hit on it. Uh, we, the capacity for Metro Rail, you know, is sort of fixed. So if we're going to get the region moving, we got to get more people on buses. And you're going to see more Metro buses, more local bus service. And um, more that's street that's and more streetcar because that's got to be part of the mix. I mean, yeah. you need all of those different levels of service. But I did want to answer a question you had about the perceived notion about um, bus drivers as not being appreciated. I have the, a different, very different experience than that. Um, we've done a lot of research um, with Arlington Transit, and in fact, found that Arlington uh, Transit bus drivers are. Um, extremely respected and get high uh, customer service scores. And um, if you would ask anybody who rides the dash bus system, I, they, they would tell you the reason they love and cherish the dash bus system is because of the, uh, the great drivers. So um, I think the local governments, and you hit on it with the, the circulator, mm -hmm. um, do have a very good appreciation for their local bus service, and it's because of the drivers. Yeah, okay, I'll very briefly. Thank you very much, um, because I think both Mr. Klein and this gentleman touched on something. And th these are that these are contracted services now. And first group, a year of an English company, very big, very well experienced in managing transit operations. They uh, and they've been involved in the past in both the Fairfax Connector and now the PRTC operation and the Circulator. They do a um, a better job than, for example, a very small new company called Forsyth that is that Arlington contracts with. And while the operators are well respected by the riders, sometimes these companies, Mr. Klein touched on it, they pay less. Mm -hmm. They they and they and they give. For example, right now it wasn't really the subject I was going to bring up, but we've got four or five unfair labor practices filed against the Arlington company. The operators are well respected by the customers, but sometimes these companies. They are profiteers, and some are w really skilled and good at doing their job. And I won't, l I won't criticize First Transit or Veolia, for example, another a French company that's huge. These are, but the local, the smaller ones that are now coming in that are trying to get some of this. The, I think they are more problematic. They lack the kind of experience that these bigger companies have. They can develop them. Um, the other big one is MV, which is an, uh, which is you know the domestic one. But these big ones, First Group and Veolia, Forsyth is small, new. This is their first real transit operation. Hey Charles, I'm going to stop you. They're just going because to need. You've given to us a lot. More training. We'll, we'll bite off it because it, it, this gets to the issue of, uh, you know, many other issues which I certainly want to give you all a chance to address. But you know, as cost continues to become an issue with mm -hmm. providing all the uh, the answers to our transportation issues contracting out services and perhaps eroding the quality of uh, what have been uh, traditional pathways to middle class job opportunities uh, you know maybe maybe declining a little bit is that something that's on your radar screen or um, not not an issue as you see it? well the gentleman was partially correct in terms of what I said but the fact is that if you look at the disparity between what Metro pay pays their bus drivers versus circulator if I remember correctly it's really more uh, like a two or three dollar difference per hour mm. But the, the huge uh, difference is in overtime. Uh -huh. Now, you can say, well, people rely on that money in their paycheck. But the fact is, that's tax dollars going to fund that. And I think I would rather have a really well-managed uh, bus system that uh, perhaps is for profit on some level, mm -hmm. but is being run in a very, or managed in a very detail-oriented way because it is for profit. And uh, I think it depends. You know, some things should be run by the government. But I think we have to look out for the taxpayers ultimately, uh, which all of us are. Um, and sometimes outsourcing it is the right thing to do. If it doesn't work out, fine, bring it back in-house. But for the most part, if you look at the experience that the three jurisdictions are having with privatizing bus service, or, or contracting, I should say, uh, overall it's been extremely positive. Okay. Well, I have to leave that there, but I want to get back to sort of individual behavior a little bit, because we've got a question from Steve who's in the Arlington, uh, lives in Arlington and is in the courthouse section of town who just asks a very basic question. How in the world am I going to pick up groceries without a car? Mm. And, you know, you sort of hear this a lot uh, from people. You know, I alluded to it earlier. My, my life, um, in some way, is dependent on at least having access to a car 
more than perhaps uh, would be feasible with a zip car situation or you know I don't live in a ritzy neighborhood so zip car is not available mm -hmm. uh, what, what what do you what do you say that speaks to me and Chris I'll give you, you a know, chance we to see start. a lot of skeptical people in fact we're in season two of the Arlington's car free diet uh, skeptics challenge and we challenged to and why don't you explain that briefly the car free diet the car free diet is um, our our program to Arlington residents and workers to get them to try alternatives but the skeptics campaign we had a, a YouTube contest where people could say I'm a, I'm a skeptic I, I don't know if I believe this transit stuff or not I drive um, and uh, the customers picked the two top people and we said you got to go car free for 30 days and they tried it and then uh, they they did YouTubes about it, and they Facebooked about it, and they shared their experience day by day so people could see what they were going through in a reality show-like way. And um, it, it garnered a lot of uh, attention. But the, to watch these two guys go through the experience, I mean, they just had to learn how to do some things differently. And so to answer Steve's question, you know, they put some paneers uh, or bags on their bicycle, and they went to the store. Or they got one of those um, carts mm -hmm. that you can walk with that you see all over the district, um, and you put your groceries in it. Or you have uh, one of the delivery services deliver. Or you learn to shop a few times a week instead of going to Costco once a month. Um, and so you make some adjustments. So there are ways you can do it. But there is a connection, again, to land use. If you live in Arlington, like let's say that, that you live around here, and you can say, well, it's, it's, it's expensive, and it's not cheap. Oh, that's the truth. It's true. <laughs> but if you do, uh, you can shop at the grocery store, you can get your dry cleaning, you can hop on the bus, you can grab a bike share bike. And so um, we need to create affordable housing, which we've worked hard on in the district. You know, in any new development, a third of, of the, of the uh, new apartments or condos are put aside. But um, we need to convince people that there's a different way of living. And then we need to create the opportunities for them to take advantage of it and then all of the options to do it. And to your point, um, if you live, let's say, in suburban Arlington, it's not practical for you, maybe you have one car instead of two. Like, m I live in the district, and, and my wife and I share a, a smart car. Mm -hmm. So we do have a car. We don't drive it that much. But the fact is, it is nice to have. And when there's a bike share station closer to me, um, a point-to-point -point, uh, car sharing system in, in, in D.C., that's when I will give up the car completely. Okay. Bob, any thoughts on this? Being someone who, uh, who counsels many of our... Uh, car owning population? <clears throat> you know, I agree with everything these guys say. And I, when I said so recently in my column, I got a letter that went something like this. So, hey, Doc, you want me to live close to work? That's what you're saying. Well, Doc, how many times do you want me to move? <laughs> I've worked in the Washington mm -hmm. region mm -hmm. for 25 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. I've had jobs in Arlington. I've had jobs in Suitland. I had a job in Bethesda. I had a job in Reston. I had a job in Southeast Washington. I had a job in Northwest Washington. How many times, Doc, do you think I should move? And it, I have no really good comeback for that. One of the great things about our region is that we've got plenty of jobs around here. We're, we're fairly wealthy. We have a very mobile population. We like all those things. Isn't that what we call the American dream? I yeah. think I read that somewhere. Yeah. Well, People pursue that dream, and and they they will do that in different places. And I'm not sure uh, how we can can make our good theories into realities for people like that. Hmm. Yeah. Now another thank you for that. Another undercurrent uh, for for all of the great ideas that that you all have have talked about and tried to implement is that these are behaviors that we rely on humans to implement. Mm -hmm. And we have no shortage of stories of awful, inconsiderate, ineffective drivers, reckless bicyclists, completely clueless pedestrians. Put that all together given all of our other transportation issues and you've got a recipe for just absolute chaos. And I, I just want to hone in on, on individual behavior and, and what in the world can we do to reduce what everybody has seen, instances of people uh, you know, in all three sort of modes that I just talked about, just 
being complete dangers to themselves and others. Well, you have to vote them off the island. We, <laughs> <laughs> we actually try to get them all to move to Ireland. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. We move them to Carrefour. Right, right. But that's where actually the great work um, that both of these gentlemen do is so important because it's really about communication, it's about marketing, it's about more carrot than stick, it's about providing all these great options and then just educating people as to why they want to try them. Um, and if and one of the reasons I'm sort of in favor of the private sector doing more is that um, they inherently uh, understand marketing somewhat because they have to or they die, right? Uh, what, what Arlington does with their TDM program that Chris runs is a national model. It's, it's, it's unusual how, how good it is. Um, I think Dr. Gridlock is unusual in terms of his, his outstanding coverage and communicating, whether it's on Twitter or in the newspaper. Um, we need more of that. And what we tried to do at DDOT was to copy a lot of stuff that they did here in Arlington and try to communicate um, what all the options are, uh, whether it's the Street Smart campaign, which is regional, to get people to pay attention to, to bikes and peds. Uh, I don't know. There, there's so much stuff. I don't think we as a region, though, spend enough money on that kind of communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's yeah. the more people that start biking and walking, um, we need to be educating people that, you know, in this region now, you need to share the road. It's not just for cars anymore. And I, I, the Street Smart campaign, I don't think, has more than a couple million dollars region wide. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're, with all the mass media out there and everybody on yeah. things like this, you know, how do we break through and get to people and teach them to have a culture of courtesy? You know, whether you're on the metro train or whether you're trying, right. you know, to merge into traffic, which <laughs> seems one of the biggest, you know, things people complain about on your website. Mm -hmm. um, how do we start to educate people more? And you know, we'll spend millions and millions and millions of dollars in capital infrastructure and in fixing the system, but we don't spend enough time uh, inculcating people into how to act when they're traveling around. Yeah, well, it's, it, I'm wondering what we could do about that. Um, you know, do we require that, that people uh, have to pass an exam to <laughs> ride a bike, a la riding a car? Do we revamp driver's ed education to take into account that yeah. roads now include dedicated bike lanes and yes. uh, to, to re-drill on some of the things that you should have learned when you got your license at right. 16? Well, we should do all of that. <clears throat> but So there's, there's carrot and there's sort of uh, marketing and doing all the stuff that, that these guys do. Then there's also making physical changes. Like one of the things I was a big fan of was doing, you know, and making the change because you don't know how long you're going to be there. And so um, creating the separated bike lanes, creating the bus only lanes, which we desperately need, we just got to make some change and do it. And it'll make everybody safer because you will separate them. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll have fewer conflicts. Um, and uh, when you take the right of way that's there and you rebalance it in favor of all the modes instead of just cars, people will start to understand. You know, I was just in New York over the weekend, last weekend, and there are so many pedestrians on, uh, like at uh, Union Square now, where they've taken half the road and given it back to pedestrians and, yep. and bicyclists. There's a, and cyclists, there's only one lane now for cars out of three or four. Um, you don't see as many cars, and there's people everywhere, and so the cars are just like, I'm not going to deal with that mess. I'm going to take a different road. We need to do more of that. You know, as, as Dr. Gridlock, I have a vested interest in public Gridlock. discontent. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm not sure I like the direction this conversation is going. He'll have to change in. his name to Dr. Something else. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm reminded that the, the most common closing line on a Dear Dr. Gridlock letter is, thank you for letting me vent. <laughs> I, I was surprised that over the years about half my letters are people expressing complaints about something the government did. Mm -hmm. well, actually, that part didn't surprise me. I pretty much expected that, that people are going to write in and complain about the, the government. Uh, that's the American way. But the other half of the letters are just simply people who want to complain about each other. As, as Chris was saying, mm -hmm. the drivers, I can get such conversations going if I mention the word merge. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on Monday when I was doing an online chat, uh, one person wrote in to complain about people who back into parking spaces sure, sure. And, and create a line mm -hmm. of people waiting. And once I published that letter on the, on the chat, I got 20 more within mm -hmm. two minutes, people wanting to take uh, either side of that argument. On, on Metro, the, the most popular topic there is complaining about people who eat or drink on the trains. Mm. 
know that, uh, or uh, we're going to see this during cherry blossom time, uh, those out-of-towners who try to hold the doors open uh, yeah. on the metro uh, cars. What about walking on the right? Or they're on the yeah. left yeah. side. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> that drives me crazy. But you know, it, it, it strikes me because I, I do actually read your column, uh, you know, rather regularly. I'm glad that you do. Well, absolutely. And uh, you've addressed the issue of the proper, legal, sensible way to merge a million and one times. And it just seems that, you know, not that it's your fault, but <laughs> somehow this seems to be alien to so many people. And, and you just wonder, how do you deal with, if you can't really figure out how to merge efficiently and safely, how are you going to deal with some of this other stuff, like dealing with areas that are built for pedestrians and bicycles and scooters and segways? And I'm afraid. We're actually even working once you get yeah. there. You, you can't merge. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, you know, Gabe, in, in D.C., I, the proliferation of, of bicycles uh, mm -hmm. travel is, has changed so much when I moved to the area, which used to be solely the purview of bicycle messengers. and. Right. And now you see, uh, as we talked about before the show, people in their business suits, uh, male and female, just utilizing the, the Capital Bike Share program, their own bikes. Uh, it seems to really uh, be taking off yeah. in D.C. Yeah. Uh, do you think um, that that's something, I mean, I know that you've worked regionally with Arlington on this bike share program. What are, what are the future possibilities for regional cooperation? And then, Chris, I'm going to go to you with where that sort of goes next in Arlington. I think the possibilities are endless uh, if the parties are willing to, to work together. I, I know when I came on board, you know, th there was back in the day there was a little, almost a little competition, a healthy competition, but competition mm -hmm. between Arlington and, and D.C., always trying to be the best, which is good. But um, uh, I had a lot of experience working with Arlington from my private sector days at, at Zipcar uh, and even in, in the electric vehicle vending business and stuff. So. Um, uh, we said, let's join forces. You know, I, uh, it's not about my ego. It's about providing the best quality service for the residents of the District of Columbia. It's also about breaking down these regional barriers. Because one thing I like to say is that to the customer, they don't really care about. You know, I'm going over the Key Bridge and now I'm in Arlington. They just want to get where they want to go. Mm -hmm. And so I was very proud, actually, of working with Arlington to bring the circulator bus across the bridge, mm -hmm. because it was sort of like the first. Um, it was like throwing down the gauntlet, you know, and saying we're, we're, we're going to stop playing these jurisdictional roles and we're going to work together. And, and the TDM program we also are working on, and that's just going to grow and grow and grow. Um, so I think there's there's tons of possibilities. And then to the point about uh, bikes taking off, uh, you know, 82% increase in three years. So you build it and they will come, whether you build more lane capacity for cars or you build lanes for bikes. And I think it's important that if we're going to have these sustainability goals, obesity goals, congestion goals, you know, we think that global warming is going to kill us, right? Well, then we have to have a little bit of courage. If we can't add a bike lane in existing space that's being wasted, then we got a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And Chris, when it comes to Arlington, uh, certainly we're seeing more of these, uh, these bike share stations popping up around town. But one criticism has been that they've, there are really no plans yet to penetrate a lot of areas that are, you know, served by lower income communities that are not already close to uh, public transportation in other ways, and it feeds this perception that exists in a lot of circles that I'm just going to give you an open-ended chance to address, that uh, a lot of our, our transit uh, focus, attention, and dollars uh, is already is placed on the already affluent, well-to-do, people who do have choices and people who maybe are not of the same station and circumstance or are kind of left behind and, and again demonized because they rely so much on old forms of transportation. Yeah, I don't think anybody's left behind. 94% of people in Arlington um, are a quarter mile within a bus stop. So everybody has access. Um, what we need to do is have good, high quality, frequent access everywhere. And if you look at Arlington's uh, master transportation plan going out to 2030 that was recently adopted by the county board, there is a plan to do that, to make sure that every neighborhood has, you know, seven day a week high quality transit service. When it comes to uh, capital bike share, um, it's in its infancy. It's going to take us about five to six years to cover the county and uh, get to about a thousand bikes like the district already has. Uh, we only you know, have 114 bikes. So this year we'll roll out another 200 in the RB quarter. But it 
it's only going to be in a thin sliver of the corridor. And then it'll start to go out. Um, you're right that we're going to hit the transit corridors first because we're going to hit the low-hanging fruit where we know we have uh, ready-made customers because so many people in the corridor don't have a car and already are used to taking transit. Um, but the key to the future is to go to make sure that all the neighborhoods have equal access. And so th that is part of our plan. But, but it's also about geography. You know, we have, we have the same complaint in, in, in the district about various things. But you always start something, whether it's Zipcar or anything else, you start it in the densest areas of the city uh, where you have the highest number of people because that's where these uh, node-based transit systems really work well. Mm -hmm. We put 10 stations over e east of the river, and to be honest, it's been less than you know, mm -hmm. utilized. Um, we need a different marketing campaign there. But we also need to recognize that uh, some neighborhoods are going to rely more on bus, and that's their mode of choice. So we got to provide premium top-level bus service instead of bike share. Mm -hmm. I want to go to a question from our studio audience. Hello, my name is Tom Fairchild. I'm director of a new initiative that is um, jointly sponsored by Arlington County and the state of Virginia called the Mobility Lab. And uh, full disclosure, it's also, uh, we're on also working with Chris Hamilton in, in his organization. And, and it's really an exciting opportunity where we're um, looking to take some of the successes that have been attained in transportation demand management in Arlington and other pockets around the state and get a baseline of resources that can be shared online as, and in a collaborative way so that that all can share in um, some of the good things that are happening. And one, the question I wanted to ask was, um, as we move um, forward, and obviously the Washington region does have a very good economy, um, but that's not something that you know, can be said elsewhere all around the state of Virginia, certainly, and around the country. Um, oftentimes it seems like some of the transportation options we talk about are looked at as not being business friendly, that really the business friendly option is the car option, the business friendly option is the more highways option. How do you think that we can get over that hurdle so that we can, can really consider some of the, um, the business friendly aspects and, and really the economic development aspects that these transportation options offer all across, not only here in the core, but across the region and throughout the state? Mm -hmm. I think you. Gabe has hit on this um, <coughs> a couple of times uh, about economic development. The um, transit-oriented development, smart growth that Arlington has, um, does drive business. Businesses want to locate in Arlington because um, you, it's easy to get around for their workforce and they're uh, attracted here because of that. We recently did a study with uh, 110 CEOs in Arlington and asked them why they were here. They loved being in Arlington. The number one reason was the transportation system and the access it gave them to downtown and to a, a creative class sort of workforce. So um, I, I don't think transportation options, Tom, are uh, some foreign concept to business leaders. I think businesses mm -hmm. know that if they're going to attract the best and the brightest, the best and the brightest want to live, work, and play in places like Arlington and downtown D.C., Bethesda. Portland. Google just opened, or they're opening their newest campus in Portland. Mm -hmm. And so why? Because their employees said that's where they want to be. And I think that's the same thing that you see here and you're starting to see in Washington, D.C. as well. I agree. All right. So, uh, you know, if, if we're able to be successful in reducing the amount of uh, vehicular trips through all these forms, um, <coughs> certainly I don't think anyone would object to that. But uh, another thing that I hear from people in addition to how does this fit within my life is really the basic economic analysis. And people look at the uh, rising costs at Metro and it looks like with their budget issues, you know, we, we may be in for a, a period of sustained and consistent uh, fare increases in order to keep that system at the levels of service it operates under. And a lot of people do the basic calculation and say, you know what, it may cost me a thousand bucks a month to have a car, but given the number of times I need to find a car to do X, Y, and Z, and the nine dollars it cost me to take public transportation to and from work every day, it's actually, uh, it's either a wash or it's a little bit cheaper to just stick with the old gas guzzling mm -hmm. vehicle. What do you say to those people who just look at the strict economics, the cost-benefit analysis, and say, you know what, not for me? 
I tell them they got to do what's best for them. I don't, I don't play transportation ideology with my readers. If they, if they think they can uh, get to work better by driving, I say, go for it. Yeah, and, then, and that means that we're not doing our job. If Metro is getting that expensive and it's cheaper to drive your car, something's not right in that equation. I think we need to look at how we're running Metro. Maybe it needs to be run more efficiently. Um, but also, I think that it's not that cars are inherently bad. It's people driving by themselves in cars. I mean, buses, this is the dirty secret. Buses are one of the most inefficient uh, transportation options in terms of miles per gallon sure. per person in some places, in a lot of places. So if we could fill every car with people, you take, you know, two or three cars off the road for every car going. And, and I think actually um, there's some very innovative concepts. Real-time ride sharing mm -hmm. is the next thing that's going to blow up. I'm actually working on a, on a business plan for it. And I think that um, people want to integrate technology with some of the more traditional forms of transportation, which is what we've done with Capital Bike Share. It's a very old type of transportation, merge with the newest, latest, and greatest technology to make it simple. And I think if more people could share cars and have seamless point-to-point -point access to, to, to vehicles, that would be great. So it's not that cars are bad. Mm. It's just the way we're using them as the primary mode of transportation by yourself in your car. That, that's not sustainable. And certainly with, with social media technology, you know, Twitter, for example, I can imagine a, a circumstance where people are are you know tweeting their their pickup circumstances for the week and looking for passengers and and being able to share vehicles to go from point A to point B, exactly. uh, but but one obstacle they may face uh, in in pursuing something like mm -hmm. that is when you get uh, for example into the district if that's where you work the cost of parking outrageously prohibitive in in many ways and you have some uh, private enterprises which sort of work in tandem by. Uh, offering some sort of a discount for, for car sharing, but that's not so prevalent and widespread. Is there any way that we sort of start to look at transportation uh, holistically, as you mentioned earlier, getting business and government, multi-jurisdictions, really working in concert instead of all doing their own individual good things? Can we ever see any sort of a I, regional you know transportation approach? I think approach? we're getting there yeah. in, in Arlington and the district. I mean. 73% uh, of employers in Arlington do help their employees with the commuting benefit. The numbers are just slightly under that in the district. Uh, it's higher than the rest of the region, but I think we have more aggressive programs in D.C. and Arlington. And I think you're right. It is a partnership. It's individuals. And so I would go back to ide ideology and I'd say individuals, uh, I'd help them do the math and I'd show them that um, Nine times out of ten, it is cheaper to use alternatives mm -hmm. than it is uh, to drive a car. And in a macro sense, as a society or f for the local governments, the state governments and the federal government, it cost us a lot more to build and maintain roads and bridges right. than it does public transportation and bike lanes. Well, that's the thing. We can't afford to just keep building capacity because, you know, uh, Eisenhower started the, the highway system, which was brilliant to, to link all the states. But then we built all this other capacity. We almost tore D.C. apart, putting in freeways. Mm -hmm. Luckily, it was stopped at a certain point. It would have ruined the character of, uh, of the city. But now we're learning how much it costs to keep that up. Mm -hmm. We don't have the money. Like Portland's entire bike program, which is looked at, at as the best in the country um, for the last like 12 years, has cost less than one mile of urban highway to build. So we're going to have to invest in these alternative modes or have to look at van pooling, ride sharing, because we can't afford to keep doing what we've been doing. And, and we can't borrow from China to subsidize building more roads and bridges. It's just not going to work. And Doc, I'm going to give you the last word on all this. What's the, what, are, what are the prospects for future regional cooperation? Well, if we had more guys like these <laughs> in our transportation system, there'd be far fewer people writing to me saying <laughs> that uh, they need to drive their cars. So you're actively hoping that that doesn't take hold, because otherwise uh, your column would be, uh, be less interesting, That's right. right? Keep it down, guys. <laughs> Dr. Bike Share. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. <laughs> well, this has been a great conversation. I really only scratched the surface and got through, uh, you know, maybe about a quarter of the notes that I, I wanted to get to during this conversation. So at some point, I'd like to have uh, you guys come back because this was a great conversation and we really touched on a lot of great ideas and a lot of great things going on to alleviate the transportation issues in our region and we certainly see that uh, some of the innovative ideas that have been born in, in Washington and in Arlington are bearing fruit 
but there's still a whole lot of ground to cover. And we didn't even talk about financing for transportation, a huge issue which dominates this entire conversation. So we're going to get back to it, and uh, hopefully you all will join us when we do. I'm Christian Dorsey, and I hope you all have enjoyed this edition of Voice Box. Thanks a lot, and have a good night.